นะโมตัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมปุทธัสสะนะโมตัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมปุทธัสสะนะโมตัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมปุทธัสสะ Introduction One Getting acquainted Today we begin a new class on Abhidhamma ever since I came to this country. I have been teaching Abhidhamma. I have thought about three or four causes, and then I stopped it. Thing. So I thought it was time. To teach again, so we have this class now. Two divisions of Buddhism. Today's talk is just an introduction. I call it getting acquainted. For example, to get acquainted with the Abhidhamma. What's Abhidhamma? Is? What is found in Abhidhamma, and so on. Before we understand what Abhidhamma is, we should understand the two major divisions of Buddhism nowadays in the world. The first one is called Theravada Buddhism or Southern Buddhism. The second is called Mahayana Buddhism or Northern Buddhism. There was one Buddhism originally, but later there was difference of opinion among the elders. Different schools of Buddhism appeared in the course of time. Nowadays. There are two major divisions of Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism is believed to be the closest to the original teachings of the Buddha. As a Theravada Buddhist, I believe the original teachings of the Buddha are recorded in the scriptures of Theravada Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism spread to the southern part of Asia, or to the southern countries. Therefore, it is sometimes called Southern Buddhism. It may not be hundred percent accurate, but people call it Southern Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism spread to Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, and also to Vietnam. Mahayana Buddhism is the latter form of Buddhism. It is different from Theravada Buddhism in many ways. This kind of Buddhism spread to northern countries. When I say north. I mean, from the middle of India, it spread to northern countries like Nepal, Tibet, Mongolia, China, Vietnam, Korea, and ultimately Japan. Since these are northern countries, it is sometimes called northern Buddhism. Sometimes, Theravada Buddhism is called Pali Buddhism, and Mahayana Buddhism is called Sanskrit Buddhism because they adapted Pali and Sanskrit languages. As their script 
languages respectively. In both Theravadas and Mahayana, there is Abhidhamma. The Abhidhamma you will be studying with me is Theravada Buddhism. I belong to Theravada. I am a Theravada Buddhist monk. I know Theravada Abhidhamma, but I am not so familiar with Abhidhamma in other schools. Therefore, Abhidhamma you are going to study with me is that taught in Theravada Buddhism. How Buddha's teachings were recorded, they then handed down. The first Buddhist council. First, we should know how Buddha's teachings were recorded and handed down to this day. Buddha did not write anything down. He just started by word of mouth. He is immediately disciples learned his teaching by heart. Three months. Yeah. Three months later, the death of the Buddha. The surviving disciples of the Buddha's headed by the Venerable Mahakashyapa held a council. A Buddhist council. At that council, all the teachings of the Buddha were collected and presented to the councils. The council consists of 500 arahants, among who were the immediate disciples of the Buddha. All the teachings of the Buddha were presented and scrutinized carefully. Only when they were satisfied that a particular teaching was the ascetic teaching of the Buddha was that teachings accepted. As a sign of acceptance, the elders recited that teaching. A sutta, for example, together, that is why the councils are known in Pali as Sangayana or Sangiti. Sangayana or Sangiti means reciting together in this way. Suttas and other teachings were accepted as a sign of acceptance. The Arahants recited the teachings together. Thus, at the first Buddhist councils, the teachings of the Buddha still fresh in the memories of his disciples were collected, presented, scrutinized, and then accepted as a subject. That was done in Rajagaha, India. The Zakan Buddhist Council. The Zakan Buddhist Council was held hundred years after the death of the Buddha. Just before that council, there were some elders who had difference of opinion with regard to some Vinaya or disciplinary rules. They could not come to an agreement with other monks, so the Sangha was divided at that time. The other group was called Mahasangika. 
the original song in order to preserve the original teachings of the Buddha, how does this become Buddhist council? It was that it was held in Vesali in India. That that council reaffirmed the teachings that were collected and accepted at the first Buddhist council. Actually, no new teachings was added, and nothing was taken away from the teachings regarded at. The first Buddhist Council. The third Buddhist Council. From that time on, different schools of Buddhism appeared about two hundred years after the death of the Buddha. There were as many as eighteen or even more schools of Buddhism. At that time. There were disagreements about not only the disciplinary rule, but other teachings as well. At the Third Buddhist Council, which was held two hundred thirty-four years after the death of the Buddha, by our reckoning. All these different opinions were examined. According to Theravada tradition, they were found to be false. So, the third council was held at that time, and that council's one book was definitely added. That book, as we have it now, is the. Katawa too. That council was held during the time of King Asoka. You may have heard of King Asoka. He was a very famous king. He is sometimes called Emperor Asoka because he ruled over almost the whole of India. He was an Exemplary, exemplary king. He gave up war while he was conquering. He could have easily annexed the southern tip of India to his kingdom of. He wanted to. But he gave up war and followed the path of Dharma. It was during his time that the Third Buddhist Council was held. At that council, also the teachings handed down from the first and the second Buddhist councils were reaffirmed, and just a little bit of addition was made. The fourth Buddhist council. Then, from that time on until four hundred fifty years after the death of the Buddha, the teachings were handed down from teachers to pupil, from generation to generation, by word of mouth. It was an oral tradition until that time. At that time, it was in Sri Lanka. The what is called the, the Four Buddhist Council was held during that time. There was a great rebellion. It was so great that people had to leave their place and go elsewhere for shelter. The monks found it difficult to survive during that rebellion. Some monks went to southern India. Many monks remained in Sri Lanka. 
although it was difficult for them to live, for example, to stay alive, they nevertheless protected the teachings of the Buddha in their memory. After the rebels, the monks who went to India came back to Sri Lanka. The monks who remained in Sri Lanka said that since they had gone through difficult times, their memories might have failed, and they might have made some mistakes in the teachings. So they compare the teachings. Those teachings of the monks who had remained in Sri Lanka, with those teachings of the monks who had gone to India and returned to Sri Lanka. When they compared the teachings, it is said there was no difference or discrepancy. After that. The monks decided that in the future, it would be very difficult for monks to retain all the teachings of the Buddha in their memory. So, they decided to write down the teachings of on palm leaf. It was about four. Hundred fifty years after the death of the Buddha in Alukvihara, that the Tikpitaka was written down on palm leaf for the first time in Buddhist history. Although it was not called the Four Buddhist Councils, obviously, later generations took it to be the Four Buddhist Councils. We also take it to be the four Buddhist councils. The four Buddhist councils. Then the four Buddhist council was held in Mandalay, Burma, a May native city. It was during the time of King Mandan. He was a very pious king. He wanted to do something. Which was not done by any king before him. He wanted to make the teachings of the Buddha last up till the end of the world. So he decided to have the Tepitaka written down on marble slabs. There were. Seven hundred twenty-nine marble slabs, on which all of the Tepitaka was written down. Those marble slabs were described by a Burmese author as the biggest book in the world. Its pages are five inches thick. About five or five and a half feet high, and about three and a half feet across. The Tepitaka was written down on this seven hundred twenty-nine marble slabs. A slab was put in a brick house. They were situated in a pagoda near Mandalay Hill. It was very lucky that one that none of these houses were hit by any bomb or any shell. During the Second World War, there was fighting around that place. Well, we can ah、uh, we can still see these marble slabs intact in Mandalay. 
if you visit Burma and go to Mandalay, it is a must that you go to see this marble slab. That council was how to coincide roughly with 2,400 years after the death of the Buddha and 2,400 monks participated in that council that council was housing 1,871 AD the sixth Buddhist council after that king there was another king he was captured by the British and Burma became a British colony after the second world war Burma gained independence in thousand nine hundred forty eight after independence both the Sangha and the political leaders of the country decided to call for another Buddhist council. They said the sixth Buddhist council would be the most comprehensive because it would include all Theravada countries representatives from Mahayana countries also were invited to the Buddhist Council. I was involved in the proceeding so that six councils, six Buddhist councils, but I was too young to be mentioned by name in the records. The Six Buddhist Council was held in Rangoon, Burma, in order to imitate the Buddhist and the First Buddhist Council, which was housed in a big cave. The government of Burma built a man made cave which could host 2,500 monks. At that place in Ragun in nineteen fifty four, the six British Councils was held. One outcome of that British Council was a well edited and well printed edition of the Tipitaka and its commentaries and sub commentaries. Nowadays, that edition is believed to be the best edition of the Pali texts, commentaries, and sub commentaries. I will be using those books throughout this class. I will be referring to those books. The teachings of the Buddha were handed down from generation to generation. At some intervals, the councils were held. The latter councils were actually the reconfirmation of what the first Buddhist councils had accepted and recorded in this way. The teachings of the Buddha have come down to to us the the present generation nowadays it has reached the United States of America divisions of Buddhist division of Buddha's teachings into Nikaya When the Buddha's teachings were recorded at the first Buddhist council, 
the elders of, Buddh of that councils divided the Buddhist teachings into different categories. There are several divisions or several categories. I want to tell you about two divisions only. One's division is into Nikayas, five Nikayas or collections. All the teachings of the Buddha were divided into five groups or five collections. The first collection is of long discourses. The second is of medium length discourses. The third is of the kind that discourses or miscellaneous discourses. The fourth is gradual discourses. And finally, the fifth is minor discourses. All the Buddha's teachings were divided into these five nikayas. Collection of long discourses, collection of medium long discourses, collection of miscellaneous discourses, collection of gradual discourses, collection of minor discourses or collection of smaller discourses in Pali they are called Diga Nigaya long discourses Majima Nigaya middle long discourses Sangyuta Nigaya Kantra discourses Angudra Nigaya gradual discourses and Kodaga Nigaya minor discourses into be the gods. Again, the Buddha's teachings were divided into three groups. They are called the Bidaga. The word Bidaga means a receptan receptacles, receptacle, a vessel or a basket. Or uh, Bidaga means thing to be learned. The verb bidaka is usually translated as basket. There are three bidaka or baskets. They are 1. Vinaya bidaka 2. Sutta or Sutanda bidaka and the Abhidhamma bidaka. Nikayas and Pitakas are separate or different short of divisions. Many people may understand this. They think Nikaya division is a subdivision, subdivision of Pitaka. But that is not so. Actually, is Buddhist book and the Pali canon belongs both to a particular Pitaka and a particular Nikaya. Let's talk, uh, let's look at the first book among the texts. The Mahavipanga is belongs to Kodaka Nikaya and as to Pitaka is belongs to Vinaya Bidaka. Niti Pakarana Petako Padesa and Melinda Panya. These three are not mentioned in the Vinaya and Dika Nigai commentaries as part of the canon. That is why some people don't include them in the Pali Canon, but in Burmi, in Burma, these are also included in the Pali Canon when they were rehearsed at the fifth 
and thanks for this consoles. They were included with regard to the Gatawa to this book as we have it today was added at the third British Councils you may read the expositor for the second for the account in details. There is a public verse found in the Vinaya commentary and the Abhidharma commentary it reads Tapetwa Chakro Pete Mikaye Diga Adike Tatanang Buddha Wachanang Nikayo Kodago Matu. The meaning is as follows the rise of the words of the Buddha excluding these four Nikaya such as Diga that means Diga Majama Sangyutta and Ankutra should be understood as Kodaga Nikaya it is strange that the holes of Vinaya Bidika and the holes of Abhidhamma Bidika belong to the Kodaka Nikaya. Kodaka Nikaya means minor teachings or minor discourses. Abhidhamma is not minor. And Vinaya is not minor either. But both of them are included in Kodaka Nikaya. The division into Nikaya and the division into Bidagas and are two different divisions. Nikayas are not subdivisions of the Bidaga. The Abhidhamma we are going to study belongs as to Nikaya to Kodaka Nikaya and as to Bidaga to Abhidhamma Bidaga. The word Abhidhamma. Now, we come to the word Abhidhamma itself. This word is composed of two parts, Abhi and Dhamma. Abhi here means excelling or disting distinguish. Dhamma means Teaching. Abhidhamma means exalting teaching or distinguished teaching. Exalting does not mean that the teachings in Abhidhamma, Pitaka, are better than, a loftier than, or nobler than those taught in the Sutta Pitaka. The only difference between those thought in Sota Pitaka and Abhidhamma Pitaka is the method of treatment, the method of presentation. The same things are taught in Sota and Abhidhamma. You find the same Dhamma, the same subjects in both Sota Pitaka and Abhidhamma Pitaka. But in Abhidhamma Pitaka, they are minutely analyzed. It excels in the teachings in Sutta Pitaka. It is distinguished from the teachings in Sutta Pitaka with regard to the method of treatment. Let us take, for example, the five aggregates. I hope you are familiar with the five 
aggregates, aggregate of matter, aggregate of feeling, aggregate of perception, aggregate of mental formations, aggregate of consciousness. Buddha taught the doctrine of five aggregates. We are composed of those five aggregates. Most begin, most beings are composed by five aggregates. These five aggregates are treated in the Sangyutta Nikaya on one page only. But the same five aggregates are treated in the second books of Abhidhamma in 68 pages. We have 68 pages versus one page. You see how different the method of treatment is in Suttanda Pitaka and Abhidhamma Pitaka. In the Suttanda Pitaka, the Buddha may elaborate on the five aggregates a little more, but it is most complete analyzes a complete treatment as in the Abhidhamma in the Abhidhamma Bhidaka especially in the Vipanga they are treated by way of explanation of Satanta method by way of explanation of Abhidhamma method and by way our questions and answers you see actually everything to be known about the five aggregate is treated in Abhidhamma not in Sudanta Pitaka so this is why it is called Abhidhamma a different sorry it differs only in the method of treatment not in the content, not in the dhammas thought in it. You find the same five aggregates in suttas and abhidhamma. You find the four noble truths in sutta and abhidhamma and so on. What is that in abhidhamma? What is taught in Abhidhamma? It is very hard to translate this word into English actually. We will say that it is ultimate teaching in contrast to conventional teaching. In Sotapitaka, in Sotapitaka, the Buddha used conventional terms like I, you, a person a woman without these conventional terms where we cannot speak at all. We cannot communicate with other people at all because we live in this conventional world. So in the Sota Pitaka Buddha taught in conventional terms but in Abhidhamma Bhidaka, most of the terms in just are not conventional terms, but terms of ultimate reality. They are different. There are almost no persons, no man, no woman in the Abhidhamma Bhidaka. You will find five aggregates, best elements, vulnerable to it, and so on. Although the subject may be the same, the way of percentage <coughs> presentation is different. Let us take the examples of water. Actually, I don't have the knowledge of chemistry. I only know that water is ozone. So I always take is that examples when I say I drink water I am using a conventional term it is the truth that 
what I am drinking is water. I am not lying. But if you go, if you go to a lab and analyze the the elements, you will not call that liquid water, but also the terms we use in Abhidhamma are like the usage of the terms also in chemistry. You are not a man. You are not a woman. You are fire aggregates. The fire aggregates are sitting right now. A group of fire aggregates is talking. About fire aggregates are listening. That is something like Abhidhamma. <coughs> In Abhidhamma, the terms used are the ultimate realities and not of convention. These realities are taught in many different ways. The realities, those that are accepted as realities, are for us in number. We will come to that later. In Abhidhamma, mind and matter are minutely analyzed a person is composed of minds and matter. Mind is, ag is again composed of C of jitta, which is translated as consciousness, and jitta sikha, which is translated as mental factor. What we call mind is a group of two things, jitta or there are 89 or 121 types of Cheta. Cheta is divided into 89 or 121 types of subconsciousness. Mental factors are divided into 52. Mind is Minutely analyze and describe it in Abhidhamma. Malaysia is also treated in detail. There are 28 material properties taught in Abhidhamma. The numbers or uh, enumeration, their causes and how they are grouped together in groups, how they arise, how they disappear in one's given life. All these things are taught in Abhidhamma. In Abhidhamma, what are realities is that that is consciousness, mental factor, matter, and Nibbana. What is Abhidhamma? What is Abhidhamma? Is it philosophy? Is it psychology? Is it ethics? Nobody knows. Sayadaw Uditala is a Burma, a Burmese monk who spent many years in the West. He is still living in Burma. He may be about nine, he's seven years old now. He said, it is a philosophy. In as much as it deals with the most general causes and principles that cover all things. So it can be called a philosophy. You find it in the causes and principles that govern all things. It is an ethical system because as animals want to realize the ultimate goal, Nibbana, 
There are no ethical teachings in Abhidhamma. Actually, there are no teachings like you are not to do this or that. You are to refrain from this. There are no such teachings in Abhidhamma, but they、uh, when it describes consciousness, it begins with、uh, what is unwholesome. It goes to consciousness of sensuous swear. Then it goes to higher states of consciousness called fine material swear. Consciousness, and then again, it goes to immaterial swear. Types of consciousness, and ultimately, it goes to Shubha Mantra consciousness. It goes from one spiritual state of Another, so it can be called ethics. As it be done, there's with the working of the mind with that process. Okay, so with that process and mental factors, it can be called a system of psychology. It is really a system of psychology because it deals with mind, matter, consciousness, mental factors, and mental materials properties. Therefore, Abhidharma is generally translated as psychoethical philosophy of Buddhism. I want to call it. Just Abhidhamma, I think that is better. When we say it is Buddhist psychology, it is psychology, but it is more than that. We may call it philosophy. Again, it is more than that. We may call it ethics. It is ethics, but it is more than that. So we will never do justice to translate. It is psychology, philosophy, or ethics. It is better to just call it Abhidharma as we Burmese do. I always tell people we Burmese are smart people. We do not translate these terms into Burmese. We just Burmese them. So. Let's just call it Abhidhamma. In Abhidhamma, you find something of philosophy, much of psychology, and also some ethics. Thank you.